bandana. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Decolonizing Light, Centering Indigenous Concerns in Science. We are thrilled to welcome all panelists and presenters, as well as you, the audience members, into this webinar today. And we'd like to signal off the top a uh, special thanks to Tanya Tajmel, Associate Professor in the Center for Engineering and Society at Concordia, for bringing this project to us. We have so many great folks around the table here today, uh, Julie Dalil and colleagues from the Kanawake Environment Protection Office, Llewellyn White, Associate Professor in First People Studies at Concordia, and some of her students are here today. All of these great folks will be introduced to you shortly, all of these great folks and more. Uh, but first, we'd just like to thank you for joining us at in virtual force space. If it's your first time uh, kind of in to our virtual channel, welcome. We do collaborate with our community to make Concordia research um, initiatives or course activities publicly accessible through interactive experiences such as today's. I'll note that we are recording the session and live streaming it as well. And I'll put those links into the chat in a moment. And we will invite you to participate in a Q&A session later today. And you can do that by using the Q&A box here in the webinar. All right, on that note, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Tanya, welcome. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Doug, from Four Space for having us today and making this event possible. I'm also very excited. I'm Tanya Taimel, Associate Professor at the Center for Engineering and Society, Concordia University, and I'm leading this project together with Dr. Llewellyn White from First People Studies, you already mentioned her, and Dr. Ingo Salzman from the Departments of Physics and Physi uh, Chemistry and Biochemistry, who is today behind the scenes and has a look at the chat and will help us with the Q&A session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located in Chochaga, Montreal, on unceded indigenous lands, and the Kanyakahaga Nation are the custodians of the lands and waters. With our project, we aim to put this acknowledgement into practice. <clears throat> our work is situated in the social and political and historical context of Canada, and I'm saying on behalf of my colleagues that we work towards a coming together and pay, paving the way for a better future, which is especially poignant given the news. Decolonizing Light is funded by the New Frontiers in Research Fund, which supports highly interdisciplinary work. The project brings together community members, researchers and students from different disciplines with the common goal to explore what it could mean to decolonize science. At Concordia, we also co closely uh, collaborate with Donna Goodleaf, who is Concordia's director for decolonizing curriculum and pedagogy. There are two normative frameworks that are particularly important for this project, especially from the, from the rights-based perspective. One is the United Nations Declarations on the Right of Indigenous Peoples, <clears throat> sorry, which states in Article 15, Indigenous peoples have the right to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories, and aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education. And the second framework, which is important, is the human right to education, which states that education must be free of discrimination and acceptable to learners. And this applies to all fields of education, also to post-secondary education, like university education, and also to science education. These two frameworks outline two important questions for our projects that we are aiming uh, to, to answer and to, to find approaches to answer. How can academic education in the science fields, in the STEM fields, be made acceptable to indigenous learners and also to other racialized groups and groups who are oppressed by colonialism? And how can academic education reflect and respect indigenous traditions histories and aspirations. The two different project activities that we are presenting today approach these questions from complementary angles. One project is in the context of a first people studies course at Concordia University, which will be presented as first project. And the other one is a citizen science project in collaboration with the Kanawaga Environment Protection Office, which will be presented around 11.30 or 11.35. After the two presentations at around 12.30, we will have a short panel discussion and we'll try to address all questions posted in the Q&A uh, section. With this, I'd like to introduce Dr. Llewellyn White, 
who is leading the Indigenous Astronomy Project. Dr. White is Associate Professor in First People Studies and her work centers on Indigenous identity formation and decolonizing research through Indigenous frameworks. Guest and discussant for this presentation is Astronomy and Astrophysics Professor Dr. Hilding Nelson from University of Toronto, who will be introduced by Llewellyn. Llewellyn, the floor is yours. Now I'll go on, Tanya. I'll just pull up a slide while I'm introducing uh, myself here. We'll just uh, start by saying Sego, Sebaquego, Llewellyn White, Yunja. I am Kanyangahaga from the community of Awasasne, and I'm an as associate professor at Concordia University in the First People Studies program. And uh, I'm trying to do my screen share. And I'm not seeing that as, a, as an option, uh, um, Doug or Anna, can you help with that? No option, yeah. You're not seeing the little- uh... Green share screen. In okay, the center there, okay. at the bottom, yeah. Now it's now it's there. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Yep. See okay. you now. Okay, great. Okay, so I just um, maybe oh, just uh, go full screen, uh, Luella. Okay, great. There we go. There you go. Is that, is that okay? Looks great. All right. Wonderful. Okay, so um, thank you all for for coming, and I'll just say a couple of words about. Uh, my role in the project a little bit in Indigenous astronomy. Um, um, just to back up from the beginning a, a little bit, I, I'm not a physicist. I don't really know much about physics, um, but I'm an Indigenous um, woman and um, I teach in First People Studies and I uh, focus my um, my teaching, my research, my life, everything is really around Indigenous knowledges, Indigenous epistemologies, ways of knowing. And I was really intrigued by this project on decolonizing light, um, in, in, in part because of the, the intersections of Indigenous knowledges and, and Western science. And so as we've been going forward with this, with this project, it, it uh, in of itself is really an example of um, different worldviews coming together. And so we've been framing our larger project with this in mind, this idea of two-eyed seeing from indigenous knowledges and um, Western ways of knowing. So I was really very in intrigued and we've um, centered that uh, uh, indigenous knowledges, which is really about relationality. So that's kind of where, where um, we are um, uh, centering ourselves and our project, our relationships with each other. So in, I, I became in, intrigued about indigenous astronomy, which I really didn't know a whole lot about either, um, in preparation for this project on decolonizing light. And I've known a bit about indigenous astronomy, but not a whole lot. So I was teaching a class last uh, fall. It's our pro seminar in first people studies here at Concordia University. So fortunately with those, I kind of create um, some alternative kinds of opportunities that are mainly experiential for our students. So I wanted to bring in a, um, a guest to speak about indigenous astronomy and his name is uh, Wilfred Buck. He's a Cree, Cree elder, and this is uh, in his uh, image. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about him and his work and what my students created from this project, from this course and their projects on Indigenous astronomy and creating their own star maps. But to help to set that context on the intersections between Indigenous astronomy and uh, Western science, We've invited uh, Hilde Nelson as a, a, uh, to provide commentary and <clears throat> further insight into these intersections. 
So I'll just introduce Hildine and ask him to, to speak a little bit about that. And then I will talk a bit more about this uh, course and what my students produced. So Hildine Nelson is Mi'kmaq. He's an assistant professor in the David A. Dunlap Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. He's an interdisciplinary scientist working on astrophysics and on the intersection of science, astronomy, and indigenous knowledge. So welcome, Hilding, and thanks for joining us today. So as I said, we've invited Hilding to provide some commentary and further insight into these intersections. So I just wanted to, to start by letting Hilding introduce himself as he wishes and to comment on why he thinks that the um, intersections between Indigenous astronomy and science, uh, what, what that's about, and uh, why Indigenous astronomy is important, and how does that hold an equal space with uh, Western science. So, Hildine, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for a moment. I think uh, Hilding might be frozen there for a moment, perhaps a bad connection. Are you back, Hilding? The floor is yours if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, it's, it's looking like a, a bad connection, folks. Uh, unfortunately, Hilding uh, keeps freezing there on our end. Um, we'll wait a few seconds, but perhaps Llewellyn, you might need to continue at this point. We'll see if we can get Hilding back in here. Okay, so shall I just proceed? And then um, we'll, we'll ask Hilding for his further comments. <clears throat> Hopefully he'll be uh, back on and, and without any technical difficulties, we can do that toward the end. Okay, so I'll go back to my screen share. You can see that okay? Okay. Okay, now I'm just trying to fix my PowerPoint there. Okay. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned um, with this course, I invited Cree elder Wilfred Buck to, to come and speak to my students as a guest lecturer. I'll just say a few words about Mr. Buck. He develops curriculum on indigenous astronomy. Um, he's um, from the Opaskwayak Cree Nation of Northern Manitoba. He was working for a number of years with the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center as a science facilitator. I, I want to just make a, 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 a quote from, from what he says about uh, astronomy. He says that every culture in the Northern Hemisphere went outside at night and saw the same stars. It wasn't only the Romans and the Greeks looking up at the sky, it was everybody. Therefore, everybody has their own stories, their own connections, has their own mythologies, their own teachings, their own social norms, and their own connection to the stars and the cosmos. He continues to say that every star has a story and that indigenous people knew those stories and stars intimately from, one, from over thousands of years of observations and living by the stars. However, Elder Wilfred Buck estimates that 85% of this knowledge has been lost. So it's been his mission to rebuild this knowledge of indigenous star stories and star maps. You can see this uh, large circular drawing here was um, created by Mr. Buck, and this is a Cree star map. So when he spoke to my students, um, he suggested that their assignment would be to provide their own representation of the night sky, so create their own star maps based on their own cultural, familial, ancestral, or personal backgrounds. So I'll just proceed and share with you some of 
my students' creations. With this, this is the, the cover of a photo book that we put together with the help uh, from uh, my research assistant, uh, Amanda, who is on with us today. And this is by Savannah uh, Matine Gabriel, who is Ganyangahaga from the community of Ganasatage. And this was the, the cover of the photo book that we created. And uh, this, is, this is by Daria. And so this, just to say a few words about the, the class, the pro seminars, uh, about 15 students or so, first people studies, majors, um, those who major in first people studies, take the pro seminar courses. And it's a mix of indigenous and non-indigenous students. So this particular student, Daria, she is um, from Iran. Her family is from Iran. And I just pulled a quote from her assignment. This is a watercolor that she did with, the, with this poem. And she's depicting the uh, mountains in uh, Iran as part of her, her homeland. This is an, a, another from Elise, and this is also a watercolor, and she's depicted a medicine wheel. And this, she comes from a settler background from the US, uh, from a farming family. And so she was struck by Mr. Buck's explanations of the North, the North Star, which you can see in the, in the middle, but how that comes out and uh, to four points and, and forms uh, what's like a medicine wheel. This is a painting uh, by Amanda Cross, who's also Gunyangahaga from the community of Gunyangahaga. And uh, she has the, the Big Dipper in the background. And by the way, they, they were creating um, pieces that were of their choice. Mixed media, paintings, poems, drawings, sketches, beadwork, whatever creative kind of work um, they felt inspired to do. And this is by da uh, oops, I lost my full screen there. This is by Daphne. I don't know if Daphne is on with us. Um, she was hoping to join us today. This is by Daphne Cardinal, who is Anishinaabe. And she did a mixed media piece with a jingle dress. Um, uh, dancer, and, and she herself is a, a jingle dress dancer. Entitled Everything is Stars. Uh, hi, Llewellyn. Oh, yes, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Sorry. Connection problems. Okay, okay. So take it over. <laughs> you can okay. talk about your work. Great, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so Annie and everyone, my name is Daphne Cardinal. I'm Anishinaabe from Temiskaming First Nations. Um, I just would like to thank everyone for having me today. And I don't want to take too much time, um, but I just wanted to, to come and present uh, the work that I did in uh, Lowland's class. Um, so this represents uh, the idea of the eight point star quilt. Uh, which uh, Mr. Wilfred Buck told the class that um, it was an important teaching. So quilts uh, with the eight point star would be wrapped around newborns as a sign of um, welcoming them into the, the universe and showing them that uh, they are the new star uh, in this world. Um, so when I did this, unfortunately, it was very cloudy uh in Temiskaming and so I couldn't actually look up and see the beautiful night sky and all the stars um that were there so I just thought at uh Wilfred's teachings uh and two quotes um came up and I 
I really hold, held on to those and it was stars represent endless possibilities and stars are energy, they are everywhere. Um, so I look back, back at my culture-based uh, practices and, and creations such as beading and making my jingle dress. And so I just use materials uh, that I could find. So including double-sided um, double bias tape, uh, leather strips, uh, even a bit of um, fabric that I use uh, for embroidery, so felt, and also uh, painting. Um, so the medicine wheel colors are pretty heavily represented there. Um, so, and then, yeah, in, in the spirit of doing a collage, um, I found a picture of uh, a jingle dress dancer, and I also um, glued the four medicines, um, and that was to represent the Milky Way and how um, it looks like dust in the sky, and um, a big uh, Anishinaabe teaching is when uh, you hold the four medicines in in your hand and when you put it in the sacred fire um, your prayers or your intentions uh, are sent up into the universe and so that smoke those uh, glimpses of little burnt pieces of cedar or sage um, reminded me of of the milky way that i finally did get to see um when it when uh, it wasn't cloudy. Um, so yeah, so yeah. Thank you for Miigwech for listening. <laughs> Noah, thank you, Daphne. I'm so glad you were able to join us. Good, wonderful. You were able to, to describe that much better than, than I would have been able to. So thank you for, for sharing. Okay, so we'll move on to, um, there are uh, a couple of other, uh, other students that were not able to join us live, but um, made a vi vi videos. So the first is Kelly Wu. So Doug, if you could pull up that video clip, it's a, 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 a almost a um, little over four minutes long. And Kelly Wu is um, uh, Chinese and, and she did this amazing, uh, stunning uh, watercolor painting that, that she will show and describe. So Doug, if you could, start that. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly. I'm really glad to be able to share my project with you, which was created for Dr. White's integrative seminar on indigenous ways of knowing, and in response to a really wonderful presentation by Mr. Wilfred Buck. So during that presentation, pre-elder and starman, Mr. Buck, had said that every culture in the northern hemisphere saw the same sky at night and they all had their own constellations, mythologies, and teachings around them. And I found that I could really relate to Mr. Buck's sharing about his first experiences with the study of stars, the constellations, and the stories that are associated with them, the Greco-Roman names and stories that are familiar to many of us. They've been made the most accessible, they're mainstream, and yet, to many of us, they may also feel distant. These aren't our names or stories. And so we can't necessarily feel a connection to them. And yet these are the ones most known to represent the things as omnipresent and as universally observable as the stars. So the, the remembering and recording and reclaiming of indigenous star lore as exemplified by the work of Mr. Buck and Mr. Chris Cannon, who's working with Dene elders to record their stories, it's really a powerful and beautiful thing to be able to offer First Nations people other entirely relevant and deeply meaningful perspectives, their own, and the sense of recognition and belonging and pride that can come with that can do so much to revitalize and heal and to recover one's sense of identity. Through Dr. White's assignment, I was able to feel just a tiny part of what that might feel like. And I can understand how much more significant these sorts of reclamation projects are for First Nations peoples. 
So I'm part of the Chinese diaspora, born in Canada with family who've been here in this country for many, many years. And I have no grasp with what's whatsoever with Cantonese or Mandarin. And so I felt like I've, I've had difficulties connecting to my cultural heritage over the years. But I found that this project has really offered me an opportunity to help shift that. I discovered that the ancient Chinese also had a rich history of astronomy, that artifacts have been uncovered that are over 5,000 years old and depict star formations. The Dunhuang Star Atlas, probably dating from before 700 of the Common Era, is the earliest known preserved star map in existence in the world and contains over 1,300 stars. I was inspired by the Ojibwe, Cree, and Dakota Lakota star charts that were shared with us during the presentation, the depictions of the constellations, and how they are organized in this wheel of the seasons. This was the inspiration for my own graphic representation of the Chinese sky based on Chinese astronomy and lore. The ancient Chinese believed that the events in the sky directly reflected events on Earth. The emperor was believed to be the son of heaven, who had been given the right to rule by heaven itself. It was vital that he could, pro that he could prove that he retained this right by predicting the movements of the sky accurately, so astronomers were basically political advisors. The ancient Chinese recognized 28 lunar mansions in five main areas or palaces. So we see the emperor seated at the center and four quarters or palaces presided over by the four sacred animals. The black tortoise in the north, also connected with the winter and the element of water. Azure dragon in the east, connected with the spring and the element of wood. Vermilion bird or red phoenix in the south, connected with summer and fire and white tiger in the west, connected with autumn and metal. On the map, east and west are inverted, because if you were to place the map overhead and orient yourself to north, west would be on the left. This representation highlights the 28 most important constellations to the ancient Chinese, situated close to, this, to the celestial equator, some of which contain pieces of some of the more familiar Greco-Roman constellations. Notice Orion, here known as the Three Stars, or Shen. My favorite constellation sets are New and New, the Ox and the Girl, and reflect the story of the Ox Herder and the Weaver Girl, which is a famous one and is the basis for the Chinese version of Valentine's Day. It's called... Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say um, uh, that these students had one week to do their projects and um, Daphne's work is stunning and Kelly did this um, watercolor painting of Chinese astronomy and within a week. So uh, um, a they had a sometimes they had a little bit longer um, if they were working on some uh, more in-depth projects, um, but but they didn't have a whole lot of time to, to do them and, and what they were able to create. And they wrote pieces to go with them uh, as well. So I, I'm very proud of, proud of my students. But before I show the last video clip, which is um, just a few minutes long, a little under four minutes, I wonder if Hildy, if, if we can get you back on now to um, um, just to comment a bit on the intersections of indigenous astronomy and Western science. Oh. Thank you. We're, we're all on. Uh, my name is Sylvie Nielsen. I'm Mi'kmaq from Newfoundland and professor of astronomy. Uh, I've been spending a number of years learning about indigenous knowledges in astronomy. Um, I'm trained as a professional astronomer. And as such, I see the biases and, and suppositions and assumptions that Western astronomers make when we view the night sky, whether it's from constellations like Ursa Major, because we all have seen bears with long tails, or whether it's how we ask questions about life in the universe, what's dark matter, the nature of cosmology. And these questions are very difficult in astronomy. The, these, these are the great challenges. We have experiments to look for evidence of uh, biology and life around other planets orbiting other stars. But all, our understanding is completely born from a Western tradition. Professor White mentioned uh, relationality. 
if we think of that as an indigenous based axiom to explore the universe, we can actually, we would actually have a very different view of what is maybe dark matter, our relation to cosmology. You know, we live in a universe that's so perfect that it actually annoys astronomers because if the properties of our universe were slightly different, we could not exist. And so this creates this principle of what gets called the anthropic principle, where people have to accept that we live in a perfect universe. And some people get away with this by creating a multiverse, by saying there's a number of universes of all random different uh, parameters. But if you think from a relational sense, I think many indigenous nations, and there's no pan-indigenous sense, would have a very different view. If you think of life in the universe and relationality, what's, you know, we, we explore this through something called the Drake equation, which asks how many civilizations there are, how, what's intelligent life. And that's so born in a Western technological perspective that would suggest that life in the, our galaxy is rare. But if we think of from our own backgrounds, be it Anishinaabe, Mi'kmaq, Cree, so on, you'd see the idea of civilization is very different. The idea of, uh, of intelligent life is very different because we're relate, we have relations with our kin as the animals and the nature and the plants. So intelligence is a whole other definition. And, that, and those put together create a whole other sense of, what, of the population of life in our, our galaxy. And so, so my takeaway from all this is that we, we really need indigenous knowledges in astronomy. I don't think indigenous peoples really need astronomers. Indigenous knowledge exists without uh, astronomers or physicists or chemists. But if we, if we want science to grow and evolve and represent humanity, we need indigenous knowledges and we need to embrace and learn from uh, people like Wilfred Buck and from the students who, in the presentations we've seen so far. And so I hope that when we go forward, we. We, and we think about astronomy and we look up and we see the constellations, you know, which as was noted, we have certain constellations we recognize because we're trained to. And those constellations were defined a century ago by professional astronomers, one of whom was British, one of whom was French, one of whom was German, like a bad joke. And instead of actually seeing those constellations, see the constellations that reflect the land, that reflect us, whether it's, the, the Great Bear for the Cree, or Muin the Great Bear for Mi'kmaq, uh, whether it's a badger from other cultures, uh, a reindeer if you're in the north, or caribou if you're in, depending where you, where you are in the world. We have all these different perspectives in relationality. And I think one of the big aspects in the next, being on this land is when we look in the sky, we should see the indigenous. We should see, our, we should see the Ganawage, we should see the Haudenosaunee, we should see Anishinaabe, we should see the Salish, Inuk, and so on. And that's because that's part of being on this land. Um, so thank you. And I really appreciated the talk so far. And I apologize for uh, my internet connection dropping out. The irony of talking about decolonizing light and depending on fiber optic cables, is, it was not lost on me. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, well, Hildine, thank you. <laughs> yes, good, good point there. Um, so I'll just end my segment on Indigenous astronomy with one last um, video clip from a student. Her name is uh, Marie Genevieve Nightingale, and she is um, a poet. So she did a spoken word. And so this is a, a, a clip of her spoken word, and she's joined by her uh, young child, uh, on the video as well. So um, Doug, if you could pull that one up, thank you. It's called Gaze Up Sky and it has three parts. I'm a little bit nervous. Okay, so one, beginning. My feet dug deep down into the earth, home, soil, earth, roots. My arms stretched, scouting, searching, seeking 360 degrees of the horizon to find my place my people, my friends, my family, my home, myself, affectionately embraced tenderness. My eyes, mind, heart, soul, spirit, reaching upward from the tips of my toes to the top of my forehead, reaching upward to the infinite dome of the skies. By day, 
Blue bright scattered with clouds, white gray, cumulus, stratus, cirrus, collecting moisture for later, rain drops pouring, snowflakes falling on us for later, for life. By dusk, by dawn, purples, indigos, violets, pinks, reds, oranges, yellows, streaks of light shining. Interruption, fog warning, thick, milky, visibility zero. Interruption, forecast, overcast, gray, dark, visibility limited. And then by night, clear night, dark, black, velvet sky, midnight, blue sky, smattered, stars scattered in the heavens above. Two, summer night sky, summer, 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 it's summer on the lake, lakeside. The wind is down since dusk, she says. The waves move to calm. Beaches, pebbles, rested, gaze down. Green grass, rolling hills, running water, gaze out. The dome of light from Sherbrooke, eastward. Gaze up, a splash of white light across the sky, Milky Way, illuminating, sparkling, shimmering, twinkling, beckoned, Big Dipper, Little Dipper, North Star. Friends in the heavens, dark sky, clear night, shooting stars. Stars above, flying, soaring, streaming, dropping, joyful, playful you. Toque, scarf, jacket, sweater, heavy socks, blanket, sister, close. Darker sky, clearer night, keep in the warmth. Summer air, moisture gathered to do, keep the wet off. Stay longer, gaze up, summer night sky, awe. Oh. Three, winter night sky. Winter, 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 it's winter. In the forest, mountain top. The snow settled since early afternoon, he says. The boughs heaved with snow, the trail powdered. Gaze down, pine needles, snow underfoot. Heavy glittering, crunch, crunch, crunch. Gaze out, moonlight cascading through trees, casting shadows. Gaze up, a splash of white light across the sky. Milky Way, vibrating, sparkling, shimmering, twinkling, beckoned, Big Dipper, Little Dipper, North Star. Friends in the heavens, dark sky, clear night, Orion above, commanding, demanding, revealing, suggesting, suggesting, onward, upward, you. Mm, toque, scarf, coat, fleece, heavy socks, two pairs, backpack, brothers together. Darker sky, clearer night, keep the pace even, winter air biting, shelter from the cold, warmed by the stove, keep the cold out, stay longer, gaze up, winter night sky, awe oh, struck. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doug. Um, just I want to just thank Marie uh, Genevieve who, who wasn't able to be here with us today, but for her incredible talent and, and her beautiful um, storytelling through through spoken word. So I will just end my segment by by just commenting that um, what what really struck me with this course and uh, my students and and our time with um, uh, Wilfred Buck is is how these stories, Indigenous star stories, Indigenous star maps have have been lost. And the importance and the relevance of First Nations astronomy, Indigenous astronomy, um, which has been overlooked by Roman Greek um, stories of stars, but we also, um, you know, have have used stars for for millennia for not just our our stories of creation, our stories of where we come from, our cosmologies, but also how how we. Uh, function and operate and live in live in our daily lives. Farming practices, migration patterns have have been in, informed by by stars. And and um, so I'll, I'll also just say one last um, teaching from from Mr. Buck is um, and what he says is that First Nations astronomy can be just as relevant as that associated with Roman or Greek mythology and makes people aware of the quality and quantity of knowledge that has been overlooked in Canada. And we arrive at knowledge from many different paths. And the more we are aware of other possibilities, the more sensitive we'll be to understand 
understanding the the differences and I would add to that then and, and the similar similarities um, as well so I'd just like to say thank you all Goa, and I will uh, turn it over to you Tanya thank you Thank you, Llewellyn and Hilding and Amanda, Kelly and Marie and Daphne for this great presentation. I think this was really impressive and we, we've got a, an idea of what it can mean to include indigenous knowledges and indigenous astronomy into university teaching as well, right? So we immediately, I think we immediately got the sense that this might uh, speak to so many more students and and attract so many more students and interest so many more students in science. And if we think about astronomy and what astronomy students are learning, uh, it's, it's really ironic or absurd to think that they are learning about the Greek skies and Greek mythologies. Uh, Greece is about 6,000 to 7,000 kilometers away, away and they are learning, they are not learning and uh, are not getting taught uh, astronomy mythologies or astronomies that are actually stories that are from this land, right? So this is really something which gives us a lot to think about. And uh, for me, especially also about thinking about acceptability of astronomy education, acceptability of science education, and how this could make science more acceptable for also for indigenous students, and obviously for many more students as well. So thank you, Llewellyn and Hilding. Okay, we are now coming to the second project. We will have time for questions and answers afterwards, but uh, now let's uh, turn to the second project. And um, we are now presenting a collaboration with the KIPO, the Kanawaga Environment Protection Office, to monitor the air quality in Kanawaga together with community members. So this project is distinct from the one that we heard now, because in this project we are using science or science is actually used to, uh, to, to better the understanding of air quality and especially also to give uh, scientific evidence for potential political decision makers. Um, and I'd like to introduce Julie Delisle, who is environmental education liaison with CAPO. Hi, Julie. Hi, everyone. Julie will lead us through the presentation of this special project. And Julie is also the mastermind behind the project's video, which you might have seen already and which we will watch as introduction. Jack, please, could you pull up the video? Air pollution consists of chemicals or particles in the air that can harm the health of humans, animals, and plants. According to the World Health Organization, 9 out of 10 people on Earth breathe polluted air. Fine particles in polluted air can penetrate deep into the lungs and cardiovascular system, leading to diseases including stroke, lung cancer, heart disease, and other respiratory infections. Air pollution can also cause a variety of negative environmental effects, including toxic ground ozone production, forest damage, water pollution, health conditions in wildlife, and global climate change. The Kahnawake Environment Protection Office is collaborating with Concordia University to create an air quality monitoring network in Kahnawake as part of the Decolonizing Light Project. The Decolonizing Light Project brings together students, community members, and scientists to address issues that are relevant for Indigenous communities. In addition, the project aims to develop science education material that incorporates Indigenous values and knowledges. The project is funded by the Canadian Research Council. The goal of the Air Quality Monitoring Project is to collect data year-long to understand the air quality in Kahnawake. Kahnawake has an unfortunate history of having commercial projects constructed through or adjacent to the community. Through the use of commercial and home-built monitors, we will gather air quality data at specific areas of concern in the community. The Air Quality Monitoring Project is also an opportunity for Kahnawake Rono to get involved in citizen science while learning more about air quality impacts. If you have any questions about the project or would like to get involved by building or hosting your own home monitor, contact the Gunawaga Environment Protection Office at environment.protection at mck.ca or 450-635-0600. Great, well, great everyone. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Llewellyn for that great presentation. It was really interesting to see all the work that you guys have been doing. Um, Doug, if you could please pull up the presentation. Thank you. Again, um, my name is Julie DeLille. I'm Turtle Clan from Gunnawaga. And as Tanya mentioned, I am the environmental education liaison for the Gunnawaga Environment Protection Office. So hopefully this video has been a good introduction to what we're gonna be speaking about today. Um, with this presentation, we'll go more into detail about our community and then the air quality monitoring project with some live feed from one of our commercial monitor sites. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so quickly I will outline some of our topics for today. First, we're going to discuss the community of Ganawage, where the project is taking place. And I will introduce who we are as Ganyukahaga. Then we will introduce the Ganawage Environment Protection Office um, and the work that we do, followed by a discussion on some potential sources of air pollution in the community. We will then look at the health effects and environmental impacts of air pollution, followed by the concept of citizen science and low-cost IoT technology. We will then look at the Gunawaga Air Quality Monitoring Project in more detail and conclude the presentation by looking at the future goals for this project. Um, so, and, and following this, of course, will be a short panel discussion with some of the presenters. So hopefully a lot of people have some good questions and can stick around for that. So next slide, please. So the community of Gunawage um, is located on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River across from the island of Dojage or Montreal, as you can see in this photo here. Um, the name Gunawage translates to the place on the rapids due to our proximity to the St. Lawrence River. Our population is approximately 8,000 on reserve and we have a territory of around 50.41 square kilometers. Our community has a traditional form of governance through the longhouse and we also have the band council system of governance. The community of Gunawage is very unique because of our high concentration and large tracts of natural ecosystems. And this provides an important role in maintaining the biodiversity of the region um, surrounding Montreal. Gunawage is home to a wide diversity of species, including species at risk. 20% of the territory is covered by wetland ecosystems. So we're very unique in this aspect for the region. Next slide, please. So that was a sh very quick intro to Gunawage, and that is the community where we're from. Who we are is the Ganyagahaga or Mohawk people. We speak Ganyageha or the Mohawk language, and we're one of eight community, uh, eight nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy alongside the Oneida, Seneca, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Tuscarora nations. The Great Law of Peace, which unified the nations, the Ohondagari Wadekwa, which is the acknowledgement and thanks we give to the natural world, and the concept of the seventh generation principle are some of what form the basis of our values and our worldviews as Ganyakahaga. The seventh generation principle is integral to our understanding of environmental protection. So the seventh generation principle is the view that all the actions that we're taking in this present day are being done for the benefit of a seventh generation down the line. We see it as protecting our environments now for the survival and the benefit of that seventh generation. So hopefully this provides a very small and a very quick overview to provide a sense of who we are and what our values are as Ganyakahaga people. And we can discuss more of these values and more of these worldviews um, in the discussion at the end maybe. Um, but now um, let me please introduce our general manager of field science at the Ganyakahaga Environment Protection Office, Mr. Patrick Gaz, who will speak more about the organization and about the potential sources of air pollution in the community. Patrick. Great, thanks Julie for that. If we could just advance to the next slide, please. So the present day Ganawagi Environment Protection Office is a unit within the Mohawk Council of Ganawagi, which is the elected government for uh, the community of Ganawagi. So currently we have 13 staff at uh, the office. Uh, and this includes uh, environment project coordinators in the areas of uh, aquatic habitats, um, terrestrial habitats, uh, contaminated sites, and climate change. Um, so they're responsible for implementing projects uh, throughout the community related to those uh, specific uh, 
focus areas. Uh, we also have uh, Julie, who you just met, who's your education uh, liaison um, person with our office. So she's responsible primarily for communications and education activities uh, in the community. Um, we have a environmental technologist and environmental inspector that uh, are responsible for um, keeping an eye on development activities in the community, uh, including uh, the movement of fill and unauthorized activities that might impact uh, the environment of the community. And then finally, we have a number of um, project support uh, staff, as well as uh, the leadership team um, and our administrative staff. So you know, this is a recent development that we've been able to expand uh, to this number of staff and it's a big growth phase for the Ganawagi Environment Protection Office. So um, you'll notice that uh, one, one focus area that we don't have at the moment is um, on air and air quality. So when we heard about uh, the project uh, and the opportunity to collaborate with Concordia on this, we we're really excited to um, take advantage of that opportunity. Um, in terms, <laughs> Right, so, so why, why is that? You know, certainly air quality is an issue that has been raised uh, quite frequently by community members. And if we could advance to the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so next slide, please. So as Julie had mentioned earlier, Ganawagi does, does appear to be a green oasis sort of, uh, you know, surrounded by, um, urban areas, uh, some agriculture, but uh, pretty intense uh, industrial uh, and urbanized areas uh, on the boundaries of the community. So, you know, people uh, naturally have, uh, have raised concerns with us about uh, the potential of all this uh, urban activity. So, you know, we do have a, a lot of wetlands and forested areas within the community, but uh, a closer look will show that there's also a number of highways, uh, railways, um, the seaway channel and industrial activities close to the community. So uh, in thinking about the project, we had sort of mapped out some areas of concern um, that would benefit from air quality monitoring and a bit of a closer look in the next few slides. So if you can advance to the next one, please. So the Mercier Bridge is a major access point for uh, the city of Montreal. Uh, and so there's uh, two major highways, Highway 132 and 138, that uh, merge at the Mercier Bridge. And this often leads to uh, excessively long traffic jams and a lot of idling cars uh, sitting uh, basically within the, the community of Kahnawagi. Um, so this is a concern. Um, you know, in and of itself. And if we advance to the next slide, um, just back one, please. You can see that not only are the, are the highways present in the community, but in some cases, as they approach the bridge, they're actually elevated above the community. So the concern here is that potentially, you know, the air, uh, the pollution stemming from all of those automobiles are perhaps extending further into the community than they might otherwise be if they were at ground level. Uh, next slide, please. Another, another issue in the community is that, you know, all of the surrounding municipalities seem to have favored uh, placing their industrial activities on the, the boundary line with the community. So in this case, on the eastern boundary of the community, uh, the neighboring uh, municipality of St. Catherine has uh, several industrial facilities. And unfortunately, on the Ganawagi side of the boundary, um, we have uh, the Ganawagi Survival School, which is the, the community high school. Um, so clearly, you know, this has uh, raised uh, concerns. If we advance to the next slide and see immediately adjacent to the boundary, we have this large uh, car recycling facility, which uh, processes uh, used cars and turns them into to scrap metal. Um, this occasionally leads to explosions uh, when cars haven't properly been uh, defueled and uh, pieces of automobiles have, have actually ended up uh, on the school grounds themselves. And there's often, uh, you know, depending on what phase of the, the process they're in, can be quite a, 
acrid smell in the air when uh, the facility is operating. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, this facility is a secondary lead smelter. So they recycle batteries and uh, again are adjacent to the community. Um, this uh, facility generates uh, a lot of lead pollution and uh, the grounds uh, around the high school have, uh, have elevated le levels of lead uh, that have been found within them. In fact, uh, the school at one point was a campus with a number of buildings uh, that the students would, would pass between. And unfortunately, uh, about, uh, I believe 15 years ago now, they had to relocate the school uh, further away from the boundary line due to the high levels of lead contamination that were present. So, you know, that lead is coming uh, in, the, in the air uh, and settling, settling uh, on the soil. So, so these two facilities are uh, a big concern for the community and we're, we're interested in knowing more about uh, the pollution uh, stemming from them. Next slide, please. Um, so here I just have a, an image of the community prior to the uh, construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, and if you just uh, advance the slide, you can have a, we just have a little fade in of the um, construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway. So in fact, it's not, uh, it's not a seaway that's adjacent to the community. You can see that it actually uh, goes right through the community and, uh, you know, turned uh, a community that was, uh, adjacent to the river and depended on the river for, for a lot of their livelihood into a community adjacent to an industrial shipping canal. And we just advance to the next slide, please. Um, back one. Okay, seem to be missing a, a slide of uh, just a couple of the, the massive ships that are passing through the community on a daily basis. So, so hundreds of ships pass through the community uh, each year and because the international nature of shipping, you know, the controls on pollution from those ships is, is less than um, one would expect. And so we do have concerns as well about uh, pollution stemming from all those ships passing through the community. Um, so those are some of the, the main uh, concerns that have been raised by the community in which we'd like to, to understand more through this project. And I will now turn the presentation over to uh, Jan and Danica, who will speak a little bit uh, about uh, air pollution generally and some of the impacts on health and the environment. Thank you, Patrick. I'll continue from here. So air pollution is one of the leading health risks for global mortality and morbidity. According to the World Health Organization, nine out of 10 people on earth breathe polluted air. In many parts of the world, air pollution levels remain dangerously high, leaving people to breathe air containing high levels of pollutants and up to 7 million people can die each year as a result of air pollution. Air pollutants can be microbiologicals, gases, and particulates. According to the 2015 Global Burden of Disease Study, exposure to outdoor fine particulate matter smaller than 2.5 micrometers alone is the fifth leading risk factor for death worldwide, accounting for 4.2 million deaths and 103.1 million disability adjusted life years in 2015. Air pollution does not recognize borders. Improving air quality demands sustained and coordinated government actions at all levels. Countries need to work together on solutions for sustainable transport, more efficient and renewable energy production and use as well as waste management. Next slide, please. Air pollution can cause various negative effects on human health. Major air pollutants include carbon monoxide, lead, ground level ozone, particulate matter, nitrous oxide, and sulfur oxides. The severe health risks, the severe health effects can be respiratory diseases, confusion, unconsciousness, lower cognitive functions, stroke, lung cancer, and even death. Next slide, please. Air pollution can also cause severe harms to our whole ecosystems. For example, air pollution can cause acid rain, eutrophication, haze, wildfire, stratospheric ozone depletion, 
crop and forest damage and global climate change. Air pollution does not recognize borders. Improving air quality demands sustained and coordinated governments actions at all levels. Next slide, please. So with that, I would like to continue a little bit about the approach uh, that we have taken in order to um, highlight, in order to measure the degree of air pollution in all those areas that are critical uh, with respect to pollution sources, but also with respect to where the population lives, uh, where the uh, population of Kahnawake goes about their daily business. Now, there are essentially two ways that are implemented uh, on a global level. One is to uh, institute uh, a, uh, a number of sensors that cover the territory, but typically the density of those sensors is quite small. So why not harness the, the power of the citizens uh, in order to provide some of the data in order to measure pollution levels where, right where they go about their business, right where they live. And, uh, as you can see on the slide, um, citizen science is probably the way how a lot of, in, a lot of environmental observations started. Um, as in agriculture, farmers were monitoring their crop, trying to make predictions of how well the year is going to turn out well, with respect to the harvest. And today, really millions of scientists are engaged in various activities related to data collection about the environment, weather data, uh, bird counts, animal counts. So it really provides uh, an opportunity for citizens to contribute uh, to research by providing data. It's also an opportunity for science, uh, for citizens to learn about uh, the projects, to learn about the data, to learn about how the data are collected. Next slide. And if you look at international efforts, uh, this is uh, an example from Central Europe. Uh, you can see what citizens are capable of in terms of covering a large territory um, with respect to air quality sensors. Here we're looking at uh, fine particulate matter that is so problematic uh, with respect to, to health impacts because they, these particles penetrate deep into the lungs. And this network of citizen uh, science stations uh, has been established and the data are collected in a central place. So the internet here plays a crucial role of bringing people's data together to draw a map of air quality that uh, originates in people's homes, in areas that are frequented, frequented by citizens uh, as they uh, do their daily business, go about their daily activities. Next slide. The sensors that make these all possible uh, fall into the category of the Internet of Things. Those are low cost sensors with quite acceptable accuracy and precision that uh, can be easily connected uh, to the Internet uh, to stream to transfer that data to a central server where it can then be displayed either on a small scale or on a very large scale. Now, this is a chance for citizens not only to contribute these data, but to build and maintain their own devices because they're cheap, the technology is widely available, and they're relatively easy to assemble. So uh, this way, uh, citizens can, can learn about the, how those sensors function, what their opportunities and their limitations are. They get an idea of uh, how the data are collected, and finally, uh, they can have their data made available to the community. One example that I would like to talk about in the next slide is some work that we've done in uh, Montreal's East End. Uh, you can see two traces here of PM 2.5, so this very fine particulate matter here. Uh, in green, the trace of a, a locally positioned air quality sensor. This was deployed in a, on a citizen's path, patio over, over two weeks in November and December 2019, especially in winter particulate matter pollution is the key parameter uh, that uh, impacts uh, citizens' quality of, life, quality of life, citizens' health. And you can cl clearly see that uh, around December 5, uh, there was a bad air quality event. This is an area in Montreal's East End that is heavily impacted by commercial and industrial activity. There's the port, uh, there's a lot of trucks leaving and uh, driving on a major highway or thoroughfare 
uh, through the east end of the city. And there are also some residential neighborhoods that are kind of enclaved uh, within uh, a commercial area that is heavy with warehouses and distribution centers, which in themselves uh, create a lot of truck traffic. So citizens have long complained about uh, uh, dust pollution, about noise as well. And you can see that uh, on December 5, the red trace, which is the city stations a few kilometers to the south, uh, does not show an exceedance of the legal limit that is imposed. Pollution is high on that particular day, but it would not raise any flags, literally, literally any alarms um, at the at the city. However, on a local, uh, the local situation on a local scale, we're seeing an exceedance of that limit by almost fifty percent. That has to do with the fact that uh, air pollution is highly variable. Really, from block to block, we see changes, quite drastic changes, which makes it necessary to monitor th that pollution on a local level. And who is better suited, uh, qualified to make those measurements than the citizens who live in that area and can deploy these cheap sensors and connect them to the internet for central data collection uh, so that we get an accurate representation of what is going on uh, on the ground, in the streets that a citizen walks through uh, in the area as her, she or he or she crosses the street uh, or is waiting for a bus. So the citizen science approach not only provides uh, academia or government authorities uh, with valuable data, it also allows them to take ownership of their environment. It allows them uh, to contribute uh, and learn about these measurement efforts. And how these sensors work uh, is something that Jan is now going to tell us in the next slide. Uh, thank you, Greg. Actually, I'll take over from here. So we'll first look into the mechanism of the particulate matter sensor. The mechanism of the laser sensor is based on laser scattering. In correspondence with the photodiode, particles in the airstream pass through a focused laser beam causing light scattering. A photodiode is a semiconductor PN junction device that converts light into an electrical current. This current is generated when photons are absorbed in the photodiode. The scattered light is then detected by the sensor and converted to a mass number concentration output through sensors algorithms. Next slide, please. The functionality of a metal oxide gas sensor is based on the conductivity change of the gas sensitive metal oxide semiconductor layers at gas exposure. A specific metal oxide gas sensitive layer reacts to oxidizing gases with layer resistance increase and reacts to reducing gases with layer resistance decrease. By use of various metal oxide semiconductor materials for the gas sensitive layers, different gases and gas mixtures can be detected. The sensitivities of metal oxide gas sensors can be improved by use of specific catalysts in these layers. For example, as shown in the animation on the right, for the reducing gas case, in clean air, donor electrons in tin dioxide are attracted towards oxygen, which is absorbed on the surface of the sensing material, preventing electric current flow. When the presence of reducing gas gases, the surface density of the absorbed oxygen decreases. Electrons are then released into the tin dioxide, generating electrical current through the sensor. We will now hand it to Cole and Wasim to introduce the technical components of the commercial monitor and our project's prototype monitor. Next slide, please. So, hello, I'm uh, Cole DeLille from the Gunawagi Environment Protection Office. Let me just finish sharing my scene. Uh, apologies for the selfie cam. Uh, my director of photography had to leave. Uh, so I'm an environmental projects coordinator at the uh, HIPO for terrestrial habitats. So I'm out here in the field to show you what our air quality monitors we have installed look like and to talk to you a bit about the area and what the concerns we might have through here are. 
So right here, we have our air quality monitor installed. Uh, the box in the middle is the monitor itself. We have the solar panel and we have the ultrasonic anemometer. So this uh, monitor here is a commercial unit. Uh, it's called the Canary S. Um, it's developed by Lunar Outpost. So here at uh, the Environment Protection Office, we purchased three of these units and we have these positioned along the St. Lawrence Seaway Canal. Um, these great units are great because the solar panel will let us put these units anywhere. Uh, the unit itself uses cellular data to uh, transmit all the information it's collecting. The ultrasonic anemometer uses sound waves to detect the wind speed. So while the monitor itself doesn't connect, collect the data on where the, uh, it just collects the data on the pollutants, this will let us know where, exactly where it's coming from. Sorry for the shaky camera. So this monitor in particular is called the uh, Kipo Harlequin 2. So this detects particulate matter, uh, 1, 2.5, 10, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and other atmospheric conditions like pressure and temperature. So these three monitors, like I said, are along the St. Leonard's Seaway Canal that Patrick mentioned earlier too, is uh, something of concern for us. So this is right downwind of the seaway. We'll walk over there to see if there's any ships passing by at the moment. So right over there, we have the exit of the seaway channel. So we have hundreds of ships passing through here each year. And if we were to take the total hours of this, this would be about 150 days worth of time each year that ships are in the river. So this is a big concern for us because we don't know what the effects are of this constant uh, uh, ship traffic. So the components we've selected to monitor uh, the nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and for one of our other sensors, ozone, were picked out to detect this information coming from the ships. Now, this data we're collecting is being uploaded live through that cellular data uh, I was talking about. We're sending this to our web-based platform, the EMSA system. It's a enhanced maritime situational awareness system. And that detects not only our air pollution, but it also can detect historical weather patterns. It can detect vessel traffic and uh, other environmental conditions. So what we could do is we can go back as we're collecting our data and compare live, uh, what was the weather on a certain day? What was the air quality like? and we can measure exactly when a ship passed by and compare that to the air quality data. So this will give, give us a great idea of what kind of uh, pollution these vessels are causing. And hopefully it can help improve our health here in the community. Uh, so that's it for me. I'll pass things over to Was Hello everyone. Uh, so yeah. No, we have been working on uh, preparing a chip, yet like uh, similar to some extent in terms of uh, what it's measuring to the the the, the commercial monitor the, that we got. So yeah, the the monitor consists. Actually, it will be better I think if I show it live. So I'm gonna switch to my second camera. Uh, so it comes with uh, this the, the PMS 503 that basically this one calculates the PM uh, it's a PM sensor calculates the dust concentration in the air this is uh, an SD card in case let's say the Wi-Fi doesn't work so we store data locally here uh, this is the B BME 680 it calculates the temperature, humidity, uh, even uh, 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 
gas concentration in the air. This is a clock module that will just keep uh, track of the time. The, the other sensor calculates the CO concentration in H3, NO2. And yeah, uh, it's fairly simple. We also have uh, an ozone sensor here. I'm going to just connect it to demo how easy it is and fairly straightforward how to connect sensors in case you want to add or to build this uh, yourself. That's besides we have technical doc documentation, I think, uh, for, uh, for the wiring, for the, the code and everything will be uh, available. So yeah, I'm going to go straight and like just show how to connect the sensor. We just need some wires. It doesn't matter how to connect them. You just have to keep track uh, of where to connect everything. So it's hard to tell, but this is VCC. Basically the, the last pin to, to my right is uh, the power, basically for the power that gets into the sensor. The second one is the power going out is the ground. And the last one is just digital output. So we're gonna go straight and connect them. For the board, we're going with the Nano 3. It's a powerful one with a lot of uh, pins. As you can see, there are even still other pins that are available. Okay. For the board, as you can see, at the end, uh, at, the, at the, the top here, sorry. This is the ground pins. These are the, the volt uh, pins and the last one are for digital uh, inputs. So we're gonna go straight and connect them and then we're gonna test uh, and get some data in. Okay, one second. So that's it. That's how we connect. For example, this is the This is the ozone sensor. It is the O3 concentration in the air. I'm gonna go straight and connect this. For example, to my laptop, just for demoing. It's gonna take uh, just a bit of time to connect to the internet uh, and everything. Once it's connected, we should be uh, able to visualize the data getting in, for example, here. And eventually it's gonna send the data right away to, uh, to the MSA server, which is the same destination where we're gonna be sending the data with the commercial uh, monitor. This is temporary housing. We'll be working on an updated version of this one where we're gonna house all the electronics. And yeah, for example, for Human purposes. This is my monitor. We created just a demo website to show so people can use to see the data getting in. As you can see, this is, for example, the P. I will show my screen, I think, probably better at this point. So yeah, this is, for example, the PM2 reading. This is the O3 uh, reading, NH3 temperature. This is the PM concentration, all three of them, PM1, 2.5, and 10. And yeah, it's going to update like every five seconds or so. This is the other readings as well for the CO pressure, TVOC, and yeah, this is the O3 readings just in a diagram pattern. And this is just a demo website to show how like to visualize quickly the, the data. 
but yeah, eventually we're going to be sending all that data right away to the MC server for further processing or just, uh, yeah, to find patterns uh, that Greg and the others were talking about, the pollution stuff. So yeah, I think uh, that's kind of it. And if anyone have any questions, you can go. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you, Asim. I think if we could just go back to the PowerPoint presentation now. And the next slide. The next slide, please, I believe. Uh, and the next slide. I think uh, Yassim, Yassim was able to provide uh, a real real time uh, demo. So uh, we'll skip right to the future outlook now, which uh, you know basically boils down to why why we're interested in, in this project and this collaboration. So at the Gunawagi Environment Protection Office, I think we've established uh, some of the concerns of the community, and with the uh, with the work that we're we're completing with uh, Concordia and. The, the students um, we're really hoping to get, increase our knowledge of the air quality within Ganawagi uh, and the health and environmental effects that some of these uh, different uh, potential sources of air pollution are, are having on, on the community. So as we know, knowledge is power and just having that data is really going to help uh, us target uh, areas for future intervention or perhaps uh, reassure the community in some ways that uh, Certain areas aren't uh, as problematic as as we feared, um, you know. And this uh, this will be ongoing. So, so we'll we'll be able, you know, have measuring the data our, ourselves. We'll have ownership over that data and can communicate it with the community, um, you know, without any concern that it's uh, being manipulated in in any way. Um, community members themselves will be able to access. Uh, the website displaying uh, current air quality information, and it will be uh, set up in a, in a easy to use format so that uh, a quick look can see, you know, green, yellow, red, in terms of uh, the, the air quality at that moment. So, you know, one concern as uh, Dr. Koss was mentioning earlier, just with respect to the variability of, of air quality measurements, uh, both uh, spatially and over time. And so those, those live feeds will be really helpful in that regard. Uh, it's also a, a great way to engage community members in the citizen science initiative and just interacting with the Ganawagi Environment Protection Office uh, as well. So, you know, building that, uh, uh, engagement with the community uh, really helps uh, open up opportunities for um, you know community members to to take ownership uh, of, of some of this information and learn learn a lot uh, along the way. Um, finally, by by allowing uh, you know with the commercial monitors that we purchased and installed uh, around the community as well, we'll be installing some of these low cost monitors at uh, the same locations. And that's gonna give us a good idea that, that these uh, low cost monitors are, are functioning uh, as anticipated and, and working as well as the, the commercial monitors. And if that's the case, um, some of these real localized issues that come up from time to time, if somebody's concerned about uh, dust on uh, a local road or any other issue, you know, we will be able to respond to that by uh, working with community members and actually just installing a, a low cost sensor at their houses so they can they can monitor uh, information themselves and, and get that reassurance. So, so a lot of possible uh, uh, benefits uh, to the community and we're really looking forward to moving forward uh, with the project. And the next slide, please. So as part of the Decolonizing Light team working on this project, uh, I have uh, quite a number of collaborators, uh, as you can see here. Um, we've, we've heard from many of them today. Um, and then the next slide, please. So just wanted to say a big nyawa, thank you for, for your attention. 
Uh, and at this point, I will turn it over to Tanya. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Julie, Cole, uh, Jan, Danica, Wasim. It was a great presentation, and I think uh, we you presented and you you you've gotten I, you gave the audience an idea of uh, Kanawage of the project in Kanawage, and I'm looking forward to questions. Are there any questions that we should? I I think now we can come together to a panel. So Patrick Cole. Uh, Llewellyn Hilding, Julie, maybe we can sh have a panel screen or something, or we just leave the screen like it is. Um, there is a question, let me see. Okay, so there is a question of Joel Trudeau. Terrific presentation. I'm just reading it. Terrific presentation. I'm a, I'm a physics prof at Dawson College. I coordinate an interdisciplinary arts and science initiative where exposure to engagement in themes raised by these amazing projects for students would be a great fit. I have been getting more involved recently with contributing to education for indigenous STEM and developing learning activities. Question one, what are your canonical sources for education and question two, where are the environment monitoring station open source resources located? I would like to get involved in some way if possible. Thanks, Joe, for your question. So what are the canonical sources for education? Maybe Llewellyn. Would you like to take this question or I'm asking it to the panel? Yes, hi, Joel, thank you for coming. Um, uh, it's really nice to connect with you. Um, it's a, it, it's um, a unique position that you're, that you're in and I'm sure you find that as well as um, Joel states that he's in Anishinaabe, Ojibwe and a physics professor. So it's really wonderful. So hopefully we can, yeah. Um, Reel you into the project in some way, shape, or form. Um, so thank you. So I'm not, I'm not sure exactly um, what what you're asking, and in, in, uh, maybe it's specific to Indigenous STEM. Um, but uh, sources that 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 I have used and that students have used in in this uh, Indigenous astronomy project are you know primarily um, in Indigenous scholars, indigenous elders and knowledge keepers, knowledge holders in particular for um, um, indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous epistemologies, um, um, Willie Ermine's work, um, the um, theoretical framework of, of uh, two-eyed seeing by Elder um, Marshall. So those are some of the um, sources that I, so I'm not sure um, if Again, if you're speaking specifically about indigenous STEM. Um, and then the other question, I guess that would be um, the air quality team. Yeah, maybe Patrick or Greg, where are the environment monitoring station open source resources located? I'll probably start here regarding the, the technical side. Um, the, the big advantage is that, is that those uh, sensors are, are quite readily available. The art here is, or the, the technical know-how is, and I can largely credit Jan and Vasim for, for doing the legwork here, is to put this together into a, uh, into a system that can work autonomously, that can transmit the data, and while there's a, a, a bunch of resources available online, uh, there's quite a bit of um, ingenuity and, uh, and know-how going into building this into a sensor that can be readily integrated into a commercial system. But I'll be very happy if you, if you contact me to, to give you some additional pointers uh, regarding parts and ex our experience with some of the parts. Uh, but it's certainly a great project uh, to involve uh, citizens in and uh, give them an idea about how these uh, sensors work and giving them the power to uh, collect and monitor their own data. 
Regarding the other locations, maybe Patrick would like to, to speak to that in terms of where they're going to be deployed. Sure, yeah, in terms of where the, the um, data sensors are, are to be deployed, um, there, it will be around the community. So we have uh, a number of sensors, uh, as were noted earlier, located along the, the St. Lawrence Seaway Channel. We have some uh, at the high school um, uh, in the adjacent to the industrial areas, some adjacent to, to highways, and then also a number of sensors in more um, say background or natural areas in the community to get some baseline information there. Uh, we're working with community members in terms of uh, locating willing hosts for, for the sensors themselves. So um, for the uh, homemade or the, the low cost sensors, we do rely on a, a Wi-Fi internet connection to upload that data into the um, uh, data computer system that we're using to, to display the information. So so we do rely on, on community partners to, to help, uh, help us in terms of citing those locations. Thanks, Patrick. Um, any further questions? Otherwise, I would like to ask a question. Uh, I mean, our project both parts of both, both uh, sub projects and the overall project is about uh, decolonizing science, decolonizing light. So this is intrinsically a critical approach as well. And maybe Julie, um, maybe I could ask you a question. Kipo's work is also as environmental organization, fundamentally critical, right? How is the work of people informed by indigenous knowledges and values? Because when we talk about science, we are also talking about values. Um, Patrick showed us the different, uh, the different constructions. They were made by engineers and by scientists according to different values, right? And um, yeah, maybe you, you can talk about that if you want, Julie. Yeah, yeah, I would say that the work that we do at Kipo is of course really linked to our culture as Kanyakahaga and the values I spoke briefly about some of where our worldview and these values come from and our beliefs, such as the Ohanda Garubekwa, which was given to us in, by the creator in our creation story. So that's where we come from, right? The Ohanda Garubekwa is our Thanksgiving address, our acknowledgement to all parts of the natural world. And that's a responsibility to give that thanks and that acknowledgement to the natural world. We were given that responsibility through our creation story by our creator. And that responsibility is done to ensure that all these parts of the natural world continue and survive. And so the work that we do now is really informed by that understanding that it's our responsibility that was given to us when we were given all parts of the natural world. We have to protect them. We have to maintain the balance with all aspects of life, right? And so the work that we do is really trying to maintain that balance to reduce any impact that we have on the natural world, to minimize any impact that we have, and to really return and restore that natural balance in the environment. And again, like I mentioned before, the seventh generation principle, we're doing all of this with the idea in our minds that we're doing this for the benefit of that seventh generation down the line. It's for our future children, it's for the survival and their benefit and maintaining that balance. So. A lot of all that we do is is based around this these principles. Thank you. Um, maybe this is this we can also link that to to in, to astronomy and cosmology. Hilding, you are teaching astronomy. You developed a course about astronomy and colonization at University of Toronto. Uh, maybe, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this course and what your students are learning there? And especially, what are the challenges in this course uh, when you are teaching physics students who come from a very, I would say from, from a very uh, scientific, Western scientific, already assimilated background? Building, if you want. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this astronomy colonization course was an eight-week graduate course. Uh, in this course, students were 
expected to learn about uh, some indigenous knowledges, how indigenous, some indigenous peoples view the, the sky and the universe, how colonization has played a role in astronomy. Um, you know, from the earliest colonization with people like James Cook and, you know, all these British and French sailors colonizing, you know, astronomy followed them and was part of that colonization effort to modern colonization with uh, the 30 meter telescope, which is a giant telescope project that Canada is a partner in and is uh, currently proposed for Mauna Kea in Hawaii against the wishes of many native Hawaiians. And even in terms of the future where we talk about lunar exploration and Martian exploration, where we use the language of colonization, where we, we talk about it in the same way that, you know, certain people, uh, colonizers talk about settling the West or settling the Americas. And so students had to sort of learn about, or the goal was to learn about these issues and reflect upon our place in that conversation as astronomers. Uh, this is largely because astronomy tends to view itself uh, as a benevolent science. You know, we study the skies for the benefit of all so everyone can learn. But the way we do that, it comes from a very specific perspective, which is this Euro a Eurocentric, born out of the Greek and Roman traditions, uh, built in the, you know, exploded in the what so-called enlightenment of, of Europe and ignore, tends to ignore indigenous peoples. And so students would, would address some of these issues and try to learn and understand. I think for a lot of students, it's a wake up call. Um, you know, the, the idea of the 30 meter telescope and the first protests by land protectors, land defenders, which spans, uh, spans almost the last decade shocked a lot of people in astrophysics and it shouldn't be surprising that it shocked them but it did and it took a long it's long conversation a long time for people to actually ask the question is you know are we the problem here as opposed to this being a conversation about religion versus science or a nimbyism or whatever it's are we being colonizers and we're starting to approach these questions very slowly um, with you know, lots of negative response. But the benefit of, I think, working with students in this is we see, I'm seeing a generation of uh, astronomers and physicists with a better understanding and, a, and, and greater interest in not only decolonizing, but respecting indigenous sovereignties and creating and understanding their place on this land. So for me, this was actually one of the more um, moving experiences because you know it gave me a bit of hope after you know, working in academia and seeing a lot, basically the most common faces, old white dude, struggling to understand that indigenous people even exist, much less have rights and have place and have under, have a complete understanding of the land. And so th this course was a very valuable experience. And, and in fact, we've actually, I've actually taught it at, at the national level to our national organization and, and members, members of the organization participated. And so we're actually building, we're building now a national dialogue in this kind of, uh, with these issues, primarily because almost the Canadian national commu community is proposing a numerous facilities around the world to do uh, cosmology, uh, astrophysical observations using radio and optical telescopes and almost all of them without a doubt are on indigenous territories whether it's in australia south africa chile across the united states and across canada thank you hilding uh there is another question for you danielle is asking she is uh excited about your course and she is asking if it would be uh, possible to access a sample syllabus for your course. Maybe, uh, Danielle, you could write an email to Dr. Nelson and maybe you can respond to her. Yeah, I think I would suggest uh, people who are interested to send me an email. Um, I'll be happy to share some information. Uh, one of the exciting developments is we're now teaching in the fall an undergraduate course related to indigeneity and astronomy. Uh, for our astronomy, uh, primarily for our astronomy undergrads, but we'll have phys stu physics students and other science students. And 
and the goal there is for our undergrads to see the indigeneity in the sky and the stars. And so, you know, when we go forward with students learning about, you know, big bang theories, evolution of stars, supernovae, they'll also learn about, you know, our place on the land, the, our connection to the sky and the stars and our needs to, our need to be better um, settlers on this land. But send me an email is the easiest way to uh, talk about these the syllabus and stuff like that. Thanks, Hilding. Danielle has also another question for us all, um, but maybe we will answer that at the end. She's asking, uh, I wonder if you could offer a sense of how you think projects like Decolonizing Light might transform STEM education and higher education in reality. Um, and then the impact you envision in your wildest dreams. So maybe we, we answer that, our wildest dreams at the end. Uh, now about a technical question, a more technical question, um, from Melissa. Thanks for the great presentation. I would like to know more about how you're, you are educating the community about the census, especially regarding the low cost census, because they provide a great opportunity to teach electronics, programming, etc. Do you have plans to teach this at school, for example? How do we answer this question? Yes, I, I mean, it would be great to teach this at school. Maybe Greg, you can. Uh, you can answer a little bit about your experience with this, um, uh, Greg or Patrick experience. I'll, I'll let Patrick speak first and I'll probably talk a little bit about uh, what this could potentially do. Mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, thanks for the question, Melissa. It is definitely uh, something that we do uh, want to incorporate in the project. So uh, through the Donawagi Environment Protection Office, we have been um, for example, broadcasting that uh, nice video that Julie put together to try to get interest from the community about the project and uh, have reached out to uh, the local high school and other number of other organizations to um, find interesting interested participants, not only to host sensors, but then also to, to construct their own sensors that they might want to install on their own building or as part of a, a school a school class. Um, so we will be, be doing some uh, sessions, hopefully in person, but potentially uh, online, depending on uh, where we're at with the COVID situation. But uh, those sensors are, we have Wasim and uh, Danica and Jan and others will be we leading uh, those sessions and helping uh, community members, including students, uh, build those sensors uh, themselves and understand the, the different components that go into those and, and uh, you know, they'll be installing and monitoring the data as well. And if I, I, I might want to add that this, this formal workshop that we are developing as part of the mandate uh, is really a chance to, to help uh, citizens understand what those instruments are, what the limitations are, um, and kind of going back to uh, Patrick Rogaz's statement about uh, being sure that what you measure outside your home is 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 data that was acquired uh, indeed outside your home, and being able to assess the situation for yourself to gain an understanding how the technology works, to gain an understanding how. Uh, the data comes about and uh, what the data tells you about your environment, about your personal health uh, is really a chance. Uh, and there are indeed multiple aspects to it. Some of it we're gonna demonstrate as part of this workshop, like putting the, the, the sensor array together as Wasim has shown in his live demonstration, this is actually quite easy to do, but there's programming involved. Uh, there is internet technologies involved, some of which we're going to provide, but it's it's a very broad field of learning opportunities uh, according to the interests that people show. Some people might just be interested in putting a sensor there uh, and making use of the data. Some might uh, simply want to learn about programming, interfacing, uh, and uh, some might want to understand how these sensors work on a chemical, physical chemical basis. Thanks, Greg. Uh, maybe since we are talking now about technology and science, but also decolonizing science and indigenous knowledges, uh, it might, there might be a question, uh, but what, what, is, what is indigenous knowledge about the census? You know what I mean? So what is, well, this is science, this is technology. And um, 
when I'm uh, asked this question, and I'm also discussing that with my students in the course, I think, and I think Kim Tolbear said that, that there is a difference between the science with the capitalized S and science with the, uh, uh, the non-capitalized S. And the science with the big science is the institutional science with the politics of science, which is defining the values, which is this defining the goals. Whereas the small science is the practice that what, what we are doing when we are building something, when we are uh, wiring something or, or calculating something. Now, of course, this is also, also the practice of science is informed by this bigger science. But I think this is the scientific, science philosophical, ab, science philosophical question uh, that, that we also have to ask ourselves when we are talking about science, about decolonizing science, but we are still using science also for, um, yeah, for empowerment, I would say, for capacity building as well. Uh, we cannot, um, science, all political decisions are based on science, right? So, uh, and it's a kind of a game. If we want to play uh, in this game, then we have to have an understanding of science in order to be able to have a voice in these processes as well. Um, I would like to go back from the technical part now again to uh, Llewellyn. Now, one, one uh, thing that I, saw in the technical part and that I like very much is the rainbow colors of our wires. So we always have these colorful wires. That's really great. Um, Llewellyn, may I ask you a question because you are expert in indigenous identity formation. And what do you think how, what role does indigenous cosmology, cosmology and, and knowledge is play in indigenous identity formation and how can indigenous identity formation be supported in the academic context? I think this is also an important question in the context of our project. Sure, uh, thank you, Tanya. Well, I'm just gonna echo a little bit about what Julie um, Zalil mentioned um, earlier. Um, and it's an, it's an, it's an interesting way to ask the question and, but it's also, it's not even really a question, I think, for, for many Indigenous peoples and myself in particular, because cosmology and identity, they're inextricably, inextricably linked. Our cosmology is our identity. Our cosmology tells us where we come from, tells us where we're going, provides us with a, a sense of cultural identity. Um, my, my work was primarily on um, Mohawk language and identity and the intersections. And, but what, what I really found through that work, through that research was how complex identity really is but in, in terms of Haudenosaunee identity, uh, Mohawk identity, um, our cosmology, which is really our creation story, um, our creation narrative, informs the basic foundation of, of, of who we are and, and, and where we come from and again, where we're going. And within Haudenosaunee cosmology, we have this story that Julie touched on a little bit, that, that we come from the stars. We come from the stars and, and, and there was a, a figure named Sky Woman who fell through a hole in the sky and came to the earth. And that was the beginning of creation on, on earth. And you know, from there, I won't, it's a very um, beautiful, lengthy story. And there's many different versions of of the Haudenosaunee creation story, but they, they all have some of the same basic elements with a sky woman and who gave birth to a daughter, first daughter who gave birth to twins and, and, and creation stemmed from there, all of life on earth. So in with that creation came as Julie was talking about through oral tradition, instructions for how to live on the earth, for how to live with each other, for how to um, give thanks 
to acknowledge, to remember, to recognize the Ohundugaliwatekwa, which is um, really a recognition of of the relationality between and among all living things on earth and in the sky. So with those instructions, um, we're, we're given those instructions on, on, on how to be um, good human beings and how to live with a good mind. And um, we were also, those instructions help us to remember where we come from. And that is enacted in our, in our lives through those narratives, remembering those narratives, but also through language, through songs, through ceremonies, through, through stories. And, and all of that really is um, the, the basic foundation of, of our identities. And so we can have bits and pieces and parts of, of these aspects of, of our identities. And as I said, it's, it's complex. And, and what my work really sort of um, concluded is, is how complex identity really is. And I was looking at language and identity. Can you, can you be um, Mohawk without your language? And um, et cetera, et cetera. Because I was finding language speakers didn't know the creation story. They, they spoke the language, but they didn't know some of those stories. And they felt that sense of emptiness that they didn't have that basic foundation and understanding, even though they, they, they spoke the language fluently. So of course it matters what you're saying in your language. Um, so it, it's, it, it's really um, important and, and critical for in, indigenous peoples to have that kind of understanding of cosmology, where we come from and every indigenous um, nation has different story, different narratives, different creation, different cosmologies. So there's a, that's incredibly diverse. We come from the stars. There's the the, the Hopi in the Southwest who come from um, deep within the earth. So there 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 there's a variety. Um, but it but it's how we relate to each other, as as well. It's how um, we come together as. as um, as Mohawk people in, in, in this case. Uh, and, and, it, and it's something that is really critical for including indigenous cosmologies, particularly for indigenous students, but to include indigenous cosmologies in our education, in our programming, in, our, in STEM as well. Um, and so, to, to neglect that really neglects indigenous knowledges about cosmology and, and how that's really connected. And students really, indigenous students want to see themselves in the curriculum. They wanna see themselves represented and they want to um, feel that this way of knowing and this um, um, inclusion in, in curriculum is held with equal regard to Western science, Western ways of knowing. So I don't know if that answers your question, Tanya, but that's what I'll say about that. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, maybe Julie, as Llewellyn mentioned you, um, you are working with youth, you are working with a Kanawake community. Um, what potential do you see? What impact such projects can have on, on youth and also on, on STEM education. And I think then we can come to this question, what would be our wildest dreams, how we can transform STEM education? Julie, please. Yeah, that was really perfectly explained, Llewellyn, thank you. And like you said, I think it's important that we incorporate the culture into all different projects like this, into all different initiatives that we do at our office, for example, to hopefully show the youth that their traditional knowledge they have, their knowledge about the culture, it doesn't need to be separated from the sciences, that there can be space for them in these fields, that they could be combined and that their knowledge that they have is just as valuable. So a lot of the work in education that we do at the office is trying to incorporate more of the language because that's connected to the identity, it's connected to this knowledge as well, like Llewellyn said. 
incorporating more of the language, incorporating the Ohanda Garda Wadekwa when we can to show the connection between that Ohanda Garda Wadekwa and all different aspects of the environment. So say like um, the birds, when we give thanks to the birds that could connect to different um, studies on birds in the community. It's all connected to the culture. Um, when we do studies on um, water quality, that's connected to giving things to Gunnigarunyu, the waters in the Ohanda Garda So it's all connected. And we want to remind the youth in the community that it doesn't have to be separate. Um, a lot of work that we've been doing now is um, focused on our social media pages. We try to share a lot of info about the environment on there and have it connected to the language um, on all the things that we put out now. Um, I, I'd like to mention that you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Gunawage Environment Protection. Um, and you can see how we're trying to incorporate more of the knowledge that the community has through there. Um, I, hopefully that answered <laughs> your question. That's perfect. Thank you, Julie. Um, so maybe we can come to this uh, last question and about our wildest dreams, what we what we would like to see, where we would like to see STEM education. Uh, and before that, I, I, I would come back, would like to come back to Hilding, because this might also be a question that many physicists are raising and that we also encountered in our project. Many physicists ask if indigenous astronomy isn't, uh, or indigenous ways of knowing uh, is astronomy or only mythology, and if decolonized and indigenous science would be science at all. So uh, we are also struggling with this question and I would like to hear you uh, on that and your take on that. Yeah, um, I, I, get, I understand the question and people's response to things like this. And I think you mentioned before the big ass science versus little ass science. And so I would start by thinking uh, that a lot of my colleagues confuse little ass science with the big ass science, which is a culture of its own. That culture is built on defining things relative to a certain set of principles, whether it's uh, experimentation, whether that everything in nature is knowable, things like, you know, ideas like that. And it's built off of a set of their understanding and biases, you know. One of the, you know, it's kind of funny that we work in a university where there's a physics department, there's a chemistry department, there's a biology department, but at some level, they all sort of need to worry about what a, what a hydrogen atom is. And so the sciences aren't, we, we talk about science in this very siloed, uh, protected way. And, and we talk in this language of you know, rationa so-called rationality and ontology, which in many respects, indigenous knowledges talk in a very different language. You know, indigenous knowledges talk from a sense of relationality, a sense of, a sense of connection, a sense of familiarity. That is antithetical to many scientists. And so I, I understand that reticence that many scientists have. But that is, doesn't have, that's not the, what we define as science historically and traditionally does not have to be the bounds of big ass science. You know, science is really about trying to explore the universe, explore nature and our place in it. You know, we, the story of Sky Woman, which I only heard in English, but that story is just as valid cosmology as the Big Bang Theory leading to life on Earth. And in many respects, the story in English, the Sky Woman story in English is almost the same thing, just with different words. And, and maybe we could have a different time scales and stuff like that. But it's not the, it's not really a different story. And so having the indigenous knowledge is, is crucial for I think for science to progress because you know if science is the same five, for lack of a better phrase, white dudes sitting in a room with the same history and the same biases, who's going to come up with the great new ideas or the great new technologies? Now, how much, how many times do we see a newspaper? write the headline scientists learned something indigenous people knew for centuries you know the other day there was a a, a press release about maori went to antarctica a millennia before the fir first white people and why are people shocked by this you know indigenous peoples we every indigenous nation and community has their own understanding of the universe and own 
their own ability to relate to it and offers sets of knowledges that help us understand and way beyond what I think Western knowledges can offer alone. This is why two-eyed seeing is so important because it's just Western knowledge is just one lens. It's just one perspective, one set of rules. With indigenous knowledges, we bring a whole other set of lenses to this, to this discussion. And in my opinion, you know, we, we like to talk about things like dark matter and dark energy and black holes and all these things in, in astrophysics. But indigenous knowledges can turn, are probably one, some of the best ways to think about how we're going to understand these ideas of dark matter. You know, is dark matter a particle? Is it a, is it a field? Is it a force? Is it a spirit? And, you know, I think listening to indigenous others and having those knowledges embraced and learned will make us better scientists. I think, personally, I think denying indigenous knowledge of science is just making us bad scientists. Thank you, Hilding. So uh, this is already uh, one vision where we would like to see STEM education being transformed through, through this project to include uh, indigenous science, indigenous astronomy, indigenous knowledges. Um, I would like to see uh, that everybody is interested in science. And I mean, not the science that we are teaching today. We have to transform science so that everybody is interested because science is something for everybody. It's like art, right? So it's the ex exclusiveness of science is not something that is that happens on purpose that happens uh, by chance it's it's actually on purpose science is a very exclusive field right and um by including different views and different perspectives i think we can make science definitely more diverse uh and also more uh respectful and by questioning the values that we are pursuing and questioning the values together with other people who have other values and other suggestions. So this would, would bring us, let in the end, probably to a common ground and to find a consensus on where science should go. It is about dialogue and it is about, um, about coming together. Um, are there any other comments about the wildest dreams that we will have in for, for our project? Okay, then uh, thank you so much. Thank you all who have participated in this presentation. Thank you uh, to the audience listening to us and engaging with us in the discussion. And thank you so much, Anna and Doug, for enabling uh, this presentation and this event. Uh, Anna, please take over from now. Thank you. And thank you, Tanya. This was absolutely amazing in every way. We are so pleased that you made the time to come together in the space here today, uh, all of you who presented, as well as the audience members. It was so great also to have Cole in the field and be able to kind of bring him into the conversation, see Wasim do his thing. You know, it was a very, it was a very rich experience, I think, for all of us. And so many great ideas were generated and so many great um, moments to, I think, reflect, reflect upon post this conversation. So we look forward to continuing this conversation in many different ways and formats um, as we move on. And it was a pleasure to meet all of you that we hadn't met before. Thank you for being here. I'll just note that um, a lot of the attendees couldn't stay the entire time, but thankfully we do have a recording. So I will be emailing everybody who registered with a link to the recording and please feel free to share that with your friends and colleagues and family members as well. It's on the Fourth Space um, YouTube channel. So just look up Concordia University Fourth Space and you'll get there, but I'll send an email with those links anyhow. Okay, on that note, it's been a great pleasure once again. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day, afternoon, and we hope to see you soon. We're closing up now, so bye everybody. Take care. Bye.